good. That's good. <laughs> we just want to welcome everybody here. We're glad you're here today. So many great things are going to be happening today. I'm not sure, but you're here. That's a good thing. So <laughs> we'll go with that. Just a couple reminders, as always. Don't forget downstairs after the service here, we do have our Sunday school. Don't forget Wednesday night, we are studying about grace. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that a little bit today. So kind of we're doing an introduction Wednesday night on grace. Great questions, great fellowship. If you can make it, we'd love to have you. Also, kick is Wednesday night at 6.30. We got our youth group going on at 6. Don't forget, we have our little thing in the back there. Again, we're just, besides your giving. Yes? You'll notice we're up to a good start this morning. Yes, the car's moving. It's moving up. We've already raised almost $4,000. Yes. That's wonderful. Thank you. So, we started our, we've been working on a series basically since the beginning of the year about the Kingdom Come 2019, with our goal basically being forgetting what lies behind us and straining forward to what lies ahead of us. We're going to press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Christ. And before I, we get into anything today, I want to make sure that everybody knows that on Wednesday, besides having a wonderful Bible study we have here, Bob David's birthday is Wednesday, so make sure you go, don't, you know, make sure you say happy birthday to Bob. I didn't forget there, old fella. <laughs> <laughs> But today, again, our whole objective is, upon this rock, I will build my church. And so we've been going through Acts, and the beginning of Acts, and how the church began, and how the church needs to be built. And when we talk about the church, we're talking about you people, not the building, but who we are. And so, again, today, we're going to be just talking about the puzzle. And if you'd like to follow along with us, we're going to be in Acts chapter 8 verses 3 through 25. Now, as you know, as everybody, we've all done some puzzles in our lives, be it crossword puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, Rubik's Cube, whatever there is out there, the, whatever that other one is called. What's that called? <laughs> yes, you, you got it. Now, I'm not that good at it, never been a person, but I can brag a little bit because I'm proud of myself. I once did a puzzle in three days, and, and I'm proud of that because on the box it said three to four years. And so, <laughs> so I thought, bam, I got that one. <laughs> Took me a couple of days. <laughs> Now, the better the puzzle, the more difficult it is to solve. And by that standards, I found out as I was researching some of this, the holy grail of such puzzles is called Solomon's Seal, or what now they call the impossible Japanese puzzle. And so, unless you know the secret, it's almost impossible to solve this. You've got to get that ring. Or it, it's, I watched it on YouTube and explain how it was done, explain the solution. And it started, uh, <laughs> it told about this Japanese man who spent 10 years figuring this out. Now, I thought for a minute, why? I mean, there is Google search out there. He could have probably had that done in no time. I mean, the only puzzle that I have worked on for so long, and I still struggle, well, it's marriage, but, you know, that's, <laughs> I can't figure you women out. I've tried, I can't, I know you look at me and go, I know, and that's a good thing. <laughs> but you notice what I said earlier, unless you know the answer to the puzzle, it's almost impossible to do. There's only one way to solve that puzzle, and you need to know the secret first in order to solve it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In our scripture today, we're going to be faced with a set of three puzzles. And again, these are riddles in the text that are almost impossible to figure out unless you understand what lies behind them. 
Unless you understand the secret, the story really makes no sense. But before we get to that, I want to just take a look at the story. Let me break the story down for us. We already know that the early church has now been in existence for about a year. And there are thousands and thousands, and we're in the thousands now of new members. And everything was seeming to go pretty well. The church was growing. People were accepting Jesus Christ. People were being baptized all over the place. And then the church meets a serious opposition. A godly Christian, we talked about this last Sunday, named Stephen, has preached before the Sanhedrin. And his message was very, very powerful. He did not hold back. He fired at these people. It was one of those in-your-face sermons. And the Sanhedrin was very upset. And they dragged him out, out of the city, and they will stone him to death. Now, the stoning of Stephen actually begins the great persecution of the Christian church. And one of the catalysts for the beginning of the persecution of the early church was a Pharisee named Saul, who we'll later know as Paul. He saw this Christian group as a threat to his faith of Israel and thus made it his mission to go out there and he was going to to destroy it. As it said in Acts 8.3, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now, facing death, facing prison, a lot of Christians scattered and ran to find, see, I like if you read it, it says, except for the apostles, they stayed in Jerusalem. But for a lot of these people, they are now being scattered. One of the men who ran was a godly deacon that we talked about earlier, that was one of the seven that was chosen, was a man named Philip. And Philip is now going to head from Jerusalem to Samaria. And now he's going to start preaching about Jesus in this new area. And he was so powerful in convincing in what he preached that as we read, it said, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And then shortly after that, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And basically... That's the story we're going to talk about. Now, there's other issues we can consider, but basically sums up what we want to talk about this morning. And in a simple story, there are three puzzles, I don't know if you caught them, that we're going to talk about today. And you're saying, well, what are those puzzles? That's what I'm here for today. The first puzzle is this. What right did Philip have to preach. He's just a deacon. He's not an elder. He never went to Bible college. He never was ordained. It would seem that he was qualified. It seemed that he wasn't qualified even to get in front of anybody to preach. The second puzzle we're going to talk about, why hadn't the Holy Spirit come upon these believers? I mean, I thought that would happen. that's what happens when you're baptized. These people were baptized. And yet, it said that the Holy Spirit did not come on these people. Because I know if I repent and be baptized and confess Jesus, I will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, what's happened here? Isn't that scripture? It is. And we're going to figure this puzzle out. But this time, it seems that they needed the apostles for some reason to come lay hands on them for them to have the Spirit. So what gives on this one? And we're going to figure that one out. And the third puzzle we're going to talk about today, why couldn't Philip just lay hands on these people anyways? Why not? It would seem Philip was more than qualified to do something like this. We're told he was a man filled with the Spirit. 
He was able to do all kinds of cool miracles. He was bringing people in left and right. He was healing people, but he apparently couldn't do this. Why? Well, we're going to get to that. Now, when it comes to puzzles, like this Rubik's Cube, I don't know if anybody remember when they first came out and how cool they were and everybody was working on them. It, I couldn't solve it. It, it, it. I never did, tell you the truth. I tried, but I didn't have the patience. I wasn't interested. I really didn't know there's a secret, there's a trick. Somebody said that you could do it. I didn't care enough about it to learn the secret. And so eventually I just set that nice little Rubik's Cube to the side. Actually, I threw that nice little Rubik's Cube way to the side. And the reason I did this is because I didn't care. I didn't care about solving this Rubik's Cube. Now, the problem a lot of time is there's a lot of Bible scholars that are like that with the Scripture. If they can't figure it out, then they just say it's okay. The implications of passages like the one we're talking about today disturb them. If a passage of Scripture doesn't fit into their theology, they just put the issue aside, embrace the theology they're comfortable with, and just move on because they don't care. Take the, the first puzzle here. What right did Philip have to preach? Again, I said he was just a deacon. He wasn't an elder. He never went to Bible college. He was never ordained. And there are a lot of churches who would never, ever, ever let this man near the pulpit because he said he's not qualified. When I took this position, I don't know how many people from the outside, the first question they asked me was, what qualifications do you have to do this? What seminary did you go to? Do you have a PhD? No, I don't. <laughs> and I explained how we operate, but for a lot of people, it didn't make sense. And so, and that's common. Even back in the day of Jesus, as we look back, back in Acts 4, the Sanhedrin confronted Peter and John and they were arrested for preaching. And the first question they asked them, the very first question was, by what power or by what name do you do this? Basically, they're saying is, what right do you have to preach like this? That's our job. We're the ones who went through all the schooling. We went through all these things. Who are you to be able to preach these things? And things haven't changed over the last 2,000 years. There's a lot of churches out there that says, if you don't have some diploma sitting on the wall, that means you ain't getting behind the pulpit. They want men with master degrees, PhDs, maybe even just a bachelor's degree might help. And they don't mind getting bored by the preacher, but if you're going to bore them, you better have a degree to bore them. Then I guess it's okay. But that's not how God works. That's not what God is trying to tell us. As we continue to read, we see when Paul wrote the church in Corinth, and he says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testament about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might be not, not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. In other words, Peter's saying this, I'm not here to dazzle you. I'm not here to impress you. I'm here so that you can see Jesus and him crucified. And for most folks in our brotherhood, Philip's being preacher really isn't a puzzle at all. We'd be very comfortable if we had a Philip come in here and preach. We'd have no problem with that. See, we figure if a guy loves Jesus, if they know the Bible, if they're not into any heresy or anything strange, if they're able to speak without just biting their tongue off, we'll let them preach. Why? Because we're not here to dazzle you or impress you. We're here 
to make sure you see Jesus and him crucified. So the first puzzle, who has the right to preach? Any man who loves Jesus enough to talk about him. There's the solving of the first puzzle. The second puzzle is this. Why hadn't the Holy Spirit fallen upon these new believers? As we read in Acts, when they, Peter and John, arrived, they prayed for the new believers there and they might, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Again, I thought when folks believed and repented and confessed Jesus and were baptized, that they were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. I mean, really, in fact, as we look back on Acts 2, 3, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, had the people in Samaria been baptized? Yes, they were. Because it said so. And when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. They believed, and they were baptized. In accordance to Acts 2.38, when they did that, they should have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. I just want to wander off just a little bit here. I want you to think about this. The question is, can you be saved if you don't have the Holy Spirit? I don't want you to answer that question. I want you to think about it. Can you be saved if you don't have the Holy Spirit? Romans 8 9 says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. You cannot be saved if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Now, I've encountered some folks who understand this concept. They realize that the Bible teaches that we can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. They understand it. And so, when they read the story in Acts 8, they confidently tell me that the Sumerians were not saved before Peter and John laid hands on them. That's when they got saved. That's when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Now, I love these folks. I just sometimes call them just kind of lazy theologians a little bit. And why are they lazy? Because maybe if they went a little further in the Bible and read Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Hmm. Hmm. Let's look at this. Because what is it saying? It's saying that God's Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our salvation. Now, had the Samaritans believed in Jesus Christ? Yes, they did. Because we read, when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news, they were baptized, both men and women. They had believed and they were baptized. And according to Acts 2.38, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit because they had repented and were baptized. And if we look according to Ephesians 1.13-14, they should have been sealed by their Holy Spirit because of their faith. And you're going, hey, what's going on here? We're not understanding. Here's the puzzle. They got baptized. Philip baptizes them all. But yet, here comes Peter... And the boys, to lay hands on them. And this is what we need to know. Because it has everything to do with the laying of hands. Before we get too deep, I want you to make sure. I want to make sure you understand this. That nowhere, I mean nowhere, 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 nowhere. I mean in the Bible, are we ever, ever taught that salvation occurs when someone lays hands on you? It's just not biblical. It's not. But, we, but what we see in Scripture is that the laying of the hands accomplished three things. And we're going to look at these three things. The first, ordination. As we read Acts 13.3. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on it, both Paul and Barnabas, and sent them off to the mission field. The laying of hands by the leadership essentially said that Paul and Barnabas were trusted by them. They were endorsing their ministry. We have faith in you. 
We endorse you. Go out there and go spread that word. The second is healing, as we read Acts 9 through 12. In a vision, he, Paul, has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. The laying of hands is often a part of healing. And here we go to number three. Imparting of charismata. Now, you're going, what is it? This is basically where we get the term charismatic. And that's what we're seeing happening here in Acts 8. Because the Greek word is describing gifts given by the Holy Spirit. These are gifts from the Holy Spirit. You see them? I want to put a little light on this if I can. The word charismata, if we break it down, it is, again, from Latin, it is, the word itself means grace. Charis means grace. Mata means the result of. Therefore, charismata means the result of the grace that is within us. The charismata was gifts that were the result of the Spirit's work in the believer. Now, in Acts 2.38, when it tells us when we repent and our bed, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here comes the trick. Here comes the puzzle. But I hope you understand this. Then, but charismata were gifts given by the Holy Spirit. The speaking of tongues. We, we, baptize, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we have this gift. But now, once you have the gift, and this is where the laying of hands came in, the apostles allowed the Holy Spirit to give you a gift. You have to have the Holy Spirit first in order to do the things that they did. This is why it was so important that the apostles laid the hands on him so they had the gift to speak in tongues, that they had the gift to heal, that they had the gift to prophesy. And that's important because God gives us the Spirit when people were saved and when the Spirit gave gifts, it was used to strengthen the church. Now, apparently, at least some of the gifts were given by the Holy Spirit through the laying of the apostolic hands. Now, this is important also because no one else could do it. No one else could do it. That's why Philip couldn't lay hands on these people. He had the Spirit in him. He didn't have the power of the laying of hands. Why? Because only the apostles could do that. And too many times we see where now we're going to have you can, you're going to get these gifts. No, only the apostles had the gift of laying hands on people that they could go out and do these things. Now, as Paul wrote, he said, "For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift, charisma of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands." So he's telling Timothy, "You can do thee because." I laid my hands on you that you can do these things. Timothy received a gift given by the Holy Spirit only when Paul laid hands on him. In Acts 19, we see again Paul on his way to Ephesus and he encountered some believers and he asked if they had received the Holy Spirit. But these folks had only been baptized in a baptism of John the Baptist. So Paul taught them about the right way to be baptized. He taught them that after they need to be baptized in water for the remission of sins through Jesus Christ. And so Paul, again, placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them and he spoke in tongues. After Paul laid his hands on them, they exhibited the gifts by the Holy Spirit. Now understand this. The Christian Samaritans were saved before Peter and John sobed up. They were saved. Having believed and having been baptized in Christ, they are saved. They received, again, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because why? Again, the Spirit was in them, but the gifts from the Spirit had not yet fallen on them. I hope you're understanding this. Because when they are baptized, they got the gift of the Holy Spirit. But once the Spirit was in them and through the lanes of hands, then this was a gift given to them from the Holy Spirit. 
And this is important to understand because it's such a puzzle. It's such a confusion to so many people. Why can't people keep doing these things? Why, you know, can, is there still laying of hands? Is there somebody out there saying, I'm going to lay my hands, you're going to get this gift, you're going to heal people, and you're going to do all these things? Only the apostles could do that. As it says in Acts 8, when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there, and they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them yet. They were already baptized. They were already saved. Now, there's a reason for this. The second puzzle, which is, why hadn't the Holy Spirit fallen upon these new believers? Because it could only happen when the apostles laid their hands on them. The third puzzle is this. Why couldn't Philip lay hands on these folks? Why was it only the apostles? Why was it that way that the apostles would give these special gifts? Well, really, the Bible really doesn't tell us why the apostles were the only ones. I got an idea because we have to look at this. When these things were happening, as they were spreading the word and proving who they were, the Bible, the New Testament, wasn't written yet. Paul, at this time, wasn't a Christian yet. And so now, they're out there having to do these things. They didn't have the New Testament like you and I have. And at the time, basically, the apostles' teaching was the New Testament. And by definition, an apostle had to be a man who had been with Jesus. As it says in Acts, Therefore it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time, with the Lord Jesus while he was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of the resurrection. You had to be one of them. Not, yeah, I knew Jesus when he was a young kid. From the time Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist to the time he was taken up. And if you were there, if you were one of those followers, the twelve, you were the men. You could do these things. Now in Acts 2.42 it goes on. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Why would they devote themselves to the apostles' teachings? The reason was they knew, these apostles knew everything anyone either needed to know about Jesus. They were with him, they hung with him, they understood him, and they loved him. They knew. They were the New Testament in the flesh. Everything that the early church knew and stood for depended on those 12 men. Everything. By the time these apostles died... The New Testament had already been pretty much written and completed. It was now being shared throughout the Christian community, throughout the Roman Empire. Thus, once these books had been completed, we see now that really there was no need for men like the apostles anymore. Their mission was done. As Jesus was here, and as he rose and ascended to heaven, his mission was done. He said, now it's up to you. You go out. And now these apostles who were spreading the word by the laying of hands to prove who they were. And now they said, now it's through faith that this needs to get done. Their mission was done. So here's Philip starting a new church in Samaria. Peter and John are sent to lay hands on those new believers, not only so they could receive special gifts from the Holy Spirit, but also that the church would be tied to the apostles. And that's important. Because the apostles were the authority on earth that tied the whole church together. It was the teaching of these apostles. It was the witness of these apostles that tie us together to where we are today. Now, today, the Bible serves that purpose. The New Testament is a collection of teachings and letters of the apostles. And we need, we don't need any new apostle. We don't need anybody to say, yes, I was there. We don't need any mortal authority coming down because the Bible is the authority. And we need to understand that. Everything we need to know, 
Everything you and I know about God is in that book. Everything we need to know about Jesus and what he accomplished for us is in that book. Everything we need to know that applies to our hope of eternity is in that book. And any preacher, if any person teaches something not in this book, is a liar. I'm sorry. Don't listen to them. Be real careful sometimes as you see preachers on the radio TV, you better know your word. You need to study that. Because a lot of times those guys mix their theology with God's and it's just not a pretty sight. Because what do we say here? What is something that if you talk to the elders or the deacons or anybody, what we say is where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, therefore we are silent. If it's not in the Bible, we are not interested in making part of what we're going to teach. As we look at some of these puzzles, the challenge of the puzzles is just not entertainment, but it's to challenge you. That's, a, that's what a puzzle's for. It wouldn't be called a puzzle if there wasn't some challenge to it. In the same way, the Bible is filled with numerous puzzles that we need to consider to make us better servants of God. Those Bible puzzles are intended to make us dig deeper and understand more about God. This is what I love about this congregation. This is what I love about who are elders and deacons because if you have a question, we don't write it off. Let's get into the scripture and see what it says. It's not about what I think. Well, I think, no. What does the scripture say? Let's dig deep into God's word. That's how we grow. That's the rock that this church needs to be built on. And how do we do these things? You study the Bible. It's just not coming Sundays, but it's going maybe downstairs and getting involved in the Sunday school. It's coming Wednesday nights. It's maybe with your family and sitting down and getting into the Bible. Because that is what God is telling us to do. That is the authority. That's where we learn. Now, we know that we looked at three puzzles in Acts 8. And while these puzzles are important to understand, they're not nearly as important as the biggest puzzle of all in all Scripture. The entire gospel message is contained in this one big, huge puzzle. And once you understand the secret of that big, huge puzzle, everything else in Scripture is going to fall completely in place. And you're saying to yourself, what is that puzzle? <laughs> I want to know what that big puzzle is. So I call up the, the singers here. I want to close with this story. And the story is about a Sunday school class that was talking, and one of the class members in the class made this comment and said, I can't understand how God could love and forgive some of the people that are out there in this world. I just don't get it. There's some very awful people out there, some just awful people. How can God forgive and love them? And they went on to tell of all the sins that they felt. They had a list of all the sins that they felt that God would, that they would have a trouble forgiving, even though they said, does God really do that? Their attitude was very harsh and very unloved. No, nope, wouldn't do it. No, nope, wouldn't do it. And the teacher paused for a minute and then said, there's something that amazes me even more than that. Because there's times I can't understand. I can't understand how God could love and forgive me. That amazed him because he recognized that the biggest puzzle in Scripture was the amazing grace of God. The amazing grace of what God has offered us. In fact, you might even know there's a song. You might have heard it on the radio <laughs> named Amazing Grace. It was written by a man, John Newton, who died in 1807, but it was, if you look at his life, he had an awful life, a wicked life, some of the struggles that he went through all his life. 
a hateful man most of his life until he found Jesus. And things changed. And just before he died, he wrote this. Though I'm not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say that I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. And I can hardly join the Apostle Paul and acknowledge, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amazing grace had allowed this to do for him. As the song says, Amazing grace, how sweet that sound that saved a wrench like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I can see. I was a wrench, I was lost, and I was blind. But it was God's amazing grace that said, no, I got you. I got you. It's because of this grace that we have a hope for salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, we just come to you thanking you for who you are.